All right, so part way into the build, we noticed a little problem. As we were turning the uh, crank uh, to set the next pistons, we came into a little bit of a bindage and couldn't figure out, okay, what's going on. So um, uh, we stopped right where we were doing because we don't want to turn it. If we're in any kind of binding, we're like, we got to stop, we got to figure it out. We turned the motor completely over, and we found that the um, basically the counterweight or that counter area, the counterbalancer of the crank was actually hitting the uh, piston, number one piston and the number two piston in its down position. So here's what was happening. As that counterweight came down, it was rubbing right here on the edge, right above that pin area. All right, so what we did, and you might need to do this from your uh, hydro machine shop, do this, etc. Okay, but what we've done is we have taken our uh, bench uh, belt sander and we've slowly taken away the extra material here where it was rubbing. We got plenty of clearance now. We are good to go. On today's episode, we finish assembly and put this thing on the engine stand and fire it up for the first time. It all happens now on Project Fast Fish. <laughs> All right, now that with the uh, rotating assembly, uh, well, assembled, it's time to go ahead and torque down your um, cap bolts. And uh, these cap bolts get uh, torqued down to 45 foot-pounds. There's no reason to do these in stages because it's just 45 foot-pounds. So all you gotta do is just turn your crank so that it's in its easiest to reach position and then take care of one, two, take care of the other side, one, two, turn the crank, take care of the next ones. So. We'll go ahead and take care of that right now. There you go. With everything all uh, locked down to torque spec on the rotating assembly, let's go ahead and give it a quick spin to make sure that there is zero bindage. And it's a good chance to kind of feel where everything is. If everything is set right, it should turn fairly smoothly. And as you can see, even with all eight cylinders in right now, we are turning nice and easy. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and let the number two cylinder stop at its top dead center. Uh, to see, or it's uh, top, to see how much clearance we have. And we're gonna verify that real quick. And we're just gonna give it the eyeball test. And right there it is at its top center. Now with the cylinder in its top position, we can go ahead and check for clearances. I've already given this the eyeball test. We've checked it before. And we can verify right here that you can see that it is not exceeding the deck height, all right? So that we are in a good position. We don't have to worry about uh, clearances, valve clearances, so on and so forth. So that is good. How much is it exactly? We don't have our machining device to check that. But uh, yeah, that's good enough for the eyeball test. And uh, we're ready to move forward. All right, now that we've checked the cycle of everything and uh, given the uh, engine a turnover, uh, we can go ahead and look at getting the heads placed on here, right? So uh, obviously the first step is making sure that the gasket is in place. On this particular uh, uh, model, you wanna make sure that you have the dowel pins set, or there are two dowel pins uh, on uh, both sides of the block, okay? One is uh, at the front of the block and the other one at the rear of the block. One's high, one's low, and the other side looks the same. And then just simply take your gasket and place it accordingly. Make sure that your gasket is matched up properly. Make sure that no holes are blocked. That is very important because you have various uh, uh, holes for oil and water and coolant to get through, all right? And now obviously this one fits multiple models depending on the head and so on and so forth, but there you go. All right, taking a look at the heads here, we do have the tools to go ahead and uh, put in the springs and the retainers and the valves. Uh, however, Roger insisted that he take care of that, so we let him uh, take care of that job for us. And the heads have been had or have the equal treatment 
All right, as you can see here, uh, things have been scuffed up and machined where needed. Uh, everything has been hot tanked and cleaned. The freeze plugs on the side uh, of the head itself have got the same treatment as the rest of the block, nice and cleanly uh, there. And of course, looking up into the uh, ports here, everything is nice and clean. Now these are J heads. Again, these are J heads. So uh, they're a little bit better than uh, uh, some of the factory 318 heads that are out there as far as airflow is concerned. All right, looking into the uh, galley there, you can see here that everything is nice and clean. Again, these have been hot tanked. All the threads are nice, uh, nice and well done. Uh, uh, they've been chased, uh, etc. And uh, everything looks good. And of course, you saw there that these definitely are the Chrysler J heads. Let me go ahead and turn this around to the other side and let you see the underneath, the actual area where the combustion itself takes place. So looking at the combustion side of these heads, you can see that the valves are nice and seated within here. And then of course, if you were to look deep, deep, deep into those uh, areas where the water flows and the dowel pins, those are all done well, uh, clean. And of course, the uh, uh, deck on the head has been uh, uh, surfaced as well to ensure flatness and even combustion uh, across the cylinders themselves. Now that we have the heads uh, on, well, temporarily placed on there, at least set in place, it's time to go ahead and uh, uh, tighten them down with the proper head bolts. Now, all the holes on the block have already been cleaned. They've already been um, thread chased, etc. So you can just go straight on there with the bolts themselves. It's also a good idea to go ahead and lightly lube the bolts with a little bit of oil before you begin this sequence. Now you're going to see here that I'm going to follow a specific uh, bolt sequence. All right. The target goal range for these heads, because these are J heads, not the stock 318 heads, but these are J heads off of 340. The ultimate goal is to get to 95 foot pounds per bolt. All right. And we're going to follow a sequence. You're going to see that sequence here in a minute. But pretty much we're going to work from the center. We're going to work back, up, all the way back, all the way forward. We're going to go to 50, then we're going to go to 95. Here's what it looks like. All right, we didn't show this on film because it is such a vital, vital part, but we got the timing and the timing gear set. Now, uh, timing is very important because without proper timing, there is a chance you'll squish a valve into a piston, and you don't want that to happen because there's all different sorts of nasty stuff that can happen, right? So, from the factory, uh, we're gonna use factory timing. Now, we're not degreeing the cam itself. If we were doing a high horsepower build, we would degree 
do a degree in the timing. In fact, the other stroker motor, we degreed the cam in there, right? But in this case, we're going to use the OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturer Timing. Now, the gears themselves have two timing marks on there so that you could simply line it up. And of course, they're kept in place with the keys on both the uh, cam and the crank, all right? So all you have to do is simply line up the dot here, the dot here, and make sure they fall within the center of both the uh, crank and the cam itself. If you are off a little bit or if you're off a tooth, you will know it and you're in a bad spot to be in. So we are set to go there. Now, as far as putting this in, it was a little bit of a balancing act because this chain does not separate. All right, so you're gonna have to kind of squeeze in the top gear and the bottom gear at the same time while making sure that you are set on your timing marks there. But once everything is set in place, once you line up your keys, everything should just slightly wedge in gently using a mallet. All right, now it's time to go ahead and get the uh, rocker arm assembly and cams into place. And uh, if you're ever doing this from scratch, just note that the original OEM uh, rocker arms are labeled right and left because there is an offset in the push rubber. It comes up from the lifters, right? So you got right and left. And an easy way to tell it if yours aren't labeled by chance is to look at the little dimple right there, okay? The dimple is on the left. It means it's going on the left. If the dimple is on the right, it's going on the right. And it looks from facing the motor. So if you were sitting here in this position down, down, right down, so like just like you're looking on the camera, it would be left and right for every single cylinder bank. Okay, and it's pretty simple. You can see that here, and these are not labeled, so we're having to rely on the dimples. Let me show you how they go on. Now these are labeled with a little mark there for R and L, which is fine. That'll work. Okay, but again, you could also rely on those dimples. See how this one's all the way to the left, and this one is all the way to the right and they go on just in that order. So simply slide them on, all right? So we slide them on. Now, we are gonna put some assembly lube down there when we actually install them, all right? Because that is just raw metal to raw metal, all right? Now note that the bolts are all facing this way. The oiling ports go this way. We also have our spacers as well. We got those in the proper order. Make sure that when you put the oiling ports on the camshaft, they are facing downwards because they oil into this section of the assembly itself. All right, so you wanna make sure those grooves down. You can see where the oil comes through, the, uh, th through that groove. Uh, there you go. Let's go ahead and get these installed. All right, because the, some of the lifters are up, because the position of the cam, like this guy right here is in its up top position, and this guy over here, or this guy right here is also near its top position, and some of these are in their near top positions, uh, we are gonna go ahead and just tighten these down in a sequence. I'm just gonna work back and forth to try to kind of tighten them down. Now, we're not torquing them to spec just yet. We wanna get that cam uh, shaft just seated because we're gonna be pushing down these um, valves as well. So uh, you wanna just do this in a sequence. So just simply start from one direction. Get it to a little bit tight. And then just kind of keep working back and forth. Some of these will be real easy. Some of these you kind of have to twist on until it is seated.
this point, we are ready to go ahead and uh, install our oil pan and our timing cover, not in that order. Uh, that way we can go ahead and supply the oil system with some oil because we're gonna turn that pump to make sure that oil is flowing where it needs to in the system. And also gives a chance for uh, pre-lubrication before we fire everything up. One of the things we've learned over the years is because of the um, older parts might be a little bit more prone to leaks due to irregularities in the uh, uh, covers and what have you, uh, it's a good idea to go ahead and coat at least the uh, timing cover uh, before the gasket with some uh, RTV. Now, we could just go ahead and put the uh, gasket on there and put it on the block itself, which would be fine. But in 3,000 miles, 5,000 miles, or even 20,000 miles, you might be looking at uh, replacing that uh, gasket again. So this gives us a little bit of added insurance to make sure that there are no leaks. When you're torquing your oil pan bolts, go ahead and torque those to 15 foot-pounds. And it's going to take multiple times to get it right because as you seat one, you're seating the other, so on and so forth. So you're going to have to work back and forth multiple times to ensure that 15 foot-pounds. But you want a good seat because you don't want any leaks inside this vital area for the blood of your motor. All right, so we got our specialty tool uh, designed to go ahead and uh, turn that oil pump. And what we're checking for is to make sure that all passages that need oil to be passing through it have oil. We're now gonna turn this thing full blast, all right? We're gonna get this thing going so where it's just simply turning that oil pump to make sure that oil is getting to where it needs to throughout the motor. All right, so I neglected to get the uh, um, filming of the oil coming through the passages, but you can see here, if you look into the motor itself, the actual oil has slightly changed color. And you could saw the, you saw the oil and the coloration slowly trickling through. So that discoloration was from the uh, leftover sediment uh, from the processes and the machining process inside the motor itself. So we are sure that we have good oil flow and oil passage. What we're doing now, 
is we are getting our timing gear set in the back uh, that attaches to the cam itself and spins the uh, uh, shaft going up to the distributor cap. So what I need to do is I need to turn the block to get that thing set in place. So let's go ahead and give it a turn and get that back gadget in there. And that gadget is, if we can get focused in on it, would you mind shining a light in there, Dad? That guy right there, what that does is it turns the, as the cam turns, okay, and it's feeding off the crank, so the crank spins off of ignition, okay, turns the cam itself, and it turns that gear. And what that gear does is there's one shaft that goes down into the oil pump itself, and of course the distributor attaches to the top of that. So it feeds both purposes off of one, uh, well, cog. So there we go. We go we are set in there all righty so what we're going to do and you're going to see this and you've seen this before if you saw the intake swap video in mike's motor works episode one you've seen us do this but we're going to do it again except we're just going to speed things up what we've done here is on this install we went ahead and installed some pins right here okay and this will help keep that cork in place now unlike the uh, performer rpm that we put in using the simple cork gasket is going to be sufficient here okay it's not going to have any blowout all right they recommended using that high build rtv for the uh performer rpm but because we're using just a standard performer this should be sufficient using the cork gasket all right so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go ahead and set the gaskets in place we're going to use a little bit of high build RTV to help prevent any leaks, especially on the edges here where they are prone to leaking and to help keep the gaskets in place, etc. And then we'll go ahead and torque, uh, place the uh, performer on there. We'll torque the bolts down in sequence. Okay, we'll get it set and then kind of work it around and then torque those in the sequence. If you need to know what that sequence is, you can either follow the video here or you can simply check out that other video on Mike's Motor Works. Oh, hey, check it out. These uh, intake or this intake has already been ported and gasket matched. Okay. And so you're going to get good airflow with this. So these have already been massaged. These have already been massaged to go ahead and um, work optimally with the setup here. So you're going to get great airflow, a little bit more, or a few extra ponies uh, beyond just the standard install. All right. So our intake for this project is an Edelbrock Performer and uh, this motor or this performer was once on the big stroker that we built for the Barracuda. Uh, of course we switched that out on an episode of Mike's Motor Works, the first one, and um, the reason we did was because it didn't have enough flow to feed the big stroker with the fuel demands. Now because we are building a stroker using a 360 crank and using a Holley uh, 600 carburetor, this should be sufficient for this motor. And if you remember also that we said that the specs for the cam uh, were optimum between the operating range of 1500 to 5500 RPM. And sure enough, the specs for this guy, the Edelbrock Performer, is rated uh, between that same range for 600 to 650 CFM carbs. So this should maintain a good air to fuel ratio and work within that uh, specified range. This is also a dual plane uh, intake, all right, so it's going to be good for off idle through 5500 RPM. Uh, so if you're powering this on a truck or a muscle car, this will be very worthy, especially when you're considering uh, low end torque as well as that 5500 RPM range. It's a fantastic assembly and combination for what we have going on here. So we're coming up to our final few parts to be put and placed on here. Uh, we have our OEM valve covers that have been, um, you know, well, refurbished and uh, got new grommets on there, a new oil fill cap, and uh, we'll get those on and uh, finish assembly. And we are ready to move this thing over 
to the engine test stand. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. We are ready to put this guy on the engine test stand. And uh, let's do a quick walk around and let you see what uh, this thing looks like. Now, this thing hasn't been painted yet. All the primer that you see was from reconditioning from the parts that were borrowed or for the new oil pan that went on the back or the bottom there. But uh, as you can see, everything is still raw iron. It'll be painted up. Uh, we're gonna use that Chrysler LA Blue to give it that factory appearance. And of course, if you haven't figured it out yet, we used a majority of factory-like parts to put this thing back together. That's why we went to factory-style rockers, the factory-style cam, the factory-style um, uh, uh, space, the factory-style spacers. And of course, the only thing that's not factory-like is the intake itself, because we were going with a little bit more performance here. Now, I will point something out here. This top spacer, what that is for is that this Edelbrock has the larger secondaries in here, but most of the modern uh, carburetors use the uh, same size secondaries. So this was an adapter plate, but it's also kind of convenient because it gives you a little bit of that extra flow and that tunneling effect there. So we are now ready to go ahead and place this guy on the engine test stand, get it fired up, get it tuned, and I'll let you guys hear what it sounds like. Good. 